from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. So, good afternoon. How are you? I'll introduce myself in just a moment. <laughs> so yeah, thank you for being here. I'm Pam Jackson. I'm the director for the Center for the Book here at the Library of Congress. And I'd like to welcome you all. I am, this, uh, the Young Reader Center here is a part of the Center for the Book. And I just want to check how many people you're here for the first time. Raise your hands. So folks some, here in the Young Reader Center, first timers. Oh wow, OK, great. And some of you, it looks like, yes, you've been here before. Yes? Oh, wow. OK, great. Well, welcome and welcome back. We are here to have a really great uh, discussion uh, and book talk. So we thank you for being here. And let me find out, where are you from? Washington School for Girls. Washington Middle School for Girls. OK, I was just checking. I knew that. <laughs> no, so we'd like to welcome you all. and. Um, what do you think you're here to talk about? Uh, a book. <laughs> <laughs> Any, you know anything more than that? That book. that book. How many of you have seen this? Have you seen this before? You've seen it on Amazon? OK, great. And are you guys used to talking about books? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Yes, I talk about books all the time, and I meet authors all the time. OK, great. All right, and so, you know, I've talked about books occasionally. Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you like books. Raise your hand. It's okay, okay, yeah. All right, and you like talking about what you, the ideas in books? How many you like that? Some, some? Okay, well, listen, you guys have a really special opportunity, and part of why we have you here is because we hope that you'll get a lot of value out of the conversation. You are going to meet Ms. Elizabeth Ween, who is the author of the book, Black Dove, White Raven. And it's a special book because it's won a particular kind of award, right? So it's a very beautiful story. It's very awesome characters that are very rich and interesting. I'm sure you can relate to them. And she takes you a number of different places. It's one of the things I like most about books. There are tons of places in the world that I don't have time to go or I don't have the money to go to them and I get to read books like this and go to those places anyway. And she's received an award, a special award that's being celebrated this weekend. And so I want to acknowledge, just a sec, I've got a, this is part I have to put on my glasses for, so please excuse me. Um, so the chil she's won the Children's Africana Book Award and there's a celebration this weekend and you'll hear about that um, shortly from, what, from one of the individuals that's with us today. Um, and to, to acknowledge what the organization is, um, it's the Outreach Council of African Study, the African Studies Association that runs that award. And re with us today is Brenda Rudolph from the organization. So we just kind of want to let you know that it's a special opportunity to be with an award-winning author. She's going to do her talk first and talk a little bit about the book and read from the book. And then there's gonna be time to ask her questions at the end. So you hold your questions and, and develop your questions. Be listening for, what do you wanna know from her? What do you wanna know about these characters? Or what do you wanna know about her writing process or whatever that is? And we'll have time for those questions at the end. Okay, and with that, I, let me introduce Elizabeth Ween. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, before before I start, this is this is a technical question. Can you all see the screen? Okay, yeah. even you guys in the back, you can Somewhat. see. Somewhat. You right in the front. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Well, I'll try to make it interesting, even if you can't see the screen. Um, I want to know before I start um, because this book is set in Ethiopia uh, in 1935, and I want to know if anybody here has any kind of relationship with Ethiopia. If you're from there, if your parents are from there, you have friends from there. Your sister's from Ethiopia, yeah. You're, okay, so the, uh, Washington has got the 
I believe it's the largest Ethiopian population outside Ethiopia, this area does. Um, so it's, it's really kind of neat for me to be talking about this book here. I live in Scotland where there is pretty much no Ethiopian population at all. Um, and I've lived there since the year 2000, so I'm assuming that's longer than any of you have been alive. You can't hear it in my accent. I was raised in Pennsylvania, um, but I've done a lot of traveling in my life. And this is, Black Dove White Raven is, I, I think it's my eighth, it's my eighth published novel, okay? Every single one of my published novels is about a character who's kind of uprooted. And I think that it's something that I've just noticed recently that I tend to write about people who aren't living where they originally come from or who aren't like the other people where they live or something like that. And I think that's because I am um, essentially where I live. I'm an immigrant. Um, and I, I've, it's, it's something I feel very deep inside me. So this book is based on my family more than anything else. These other two books that you see up here, Codename Verity and Rose Under Fire, are kind of World War II adventures. Mm -hmm. And I wrote them because I, they got inspired because I learned to fly in uh, 2003. I got a pilot's, private pilot's license. And I really wanted to write about flying. And what I ended up doing was writing about women in aviation. So the first book, Codename Verity, is about a young woman who becomes a pilot and another young woman who is a spy. And it's kind of an adventure story. And it's also about their friendship during World War II. Rose Under Fire is about another young woman who is a pilot. And these are all based on real people who did real things. And I found that as I was writing these stories, and I feel this really talking to a girl's school in particular, that suddenly I'd become kind of an advocate for women in aviation. So I have to give you my women in aviation speech before I go on to talk about, to talk about Black Dove White Raven. Have any of you ever had a flight in a small plane, like a small aircraft this size? Yeah, we have one there. How did that come about? Come about? Yeah. Why, why did you? Why were you? Why did you end up in a small plane? <coughs> because I was um, going to somewhere not that far. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because sometimes they they put you in a little tiny plane that only seats like ten or twenty people or something like that. Has anybody ever been in one that like seats four people? A uh, grown up in the, these grown ups. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. You know. <laughs> no. So. How did you end up in a small plane? Are you a pilot? Uh, no, my, my brother's a pilot in California, and uh, so he took us up, my dad and I, and brought us to Catalina uh -huh. and Big Bear. And, uh, you know, so that, that, that was just it. Okay. I, it's something that I think doesn't occur to a, a lot of young girls, that you can get careers in aviation. Um, so, you know, don't rule it out, basically. And if you want to be inspired, Codename Verity and Rose Under Fire are about young women who are, who are flying and who are pilots. Black Dove White Raven also has pilots in it, and it was kind of, a, for me, a combination of being interested in flying and also being interested in Ethiopia. I, my interest in Ethiopia goes back to my aunt and uncle, Susan and Roger Whitaker, who were in the Peace Corps teaching English, whoops, teaching English there in the 1960s. And uh, when I finally got to go there myself, it was on a trip with my aunt and uncle who went back uh, for their 35th wedding anniversary and were nice enough to take me with them. Um, so I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna kinda take you on a little bit of a tour, especially as, as it seems that most of you um, don't really have an association with the country, but I'm also gonna ask you a few questions about, about what you know about Ethiopia. This isn't, this isn't a quiz, you're not gonna get graded. Um, <laughs> so how many of you know that Ethiopia is the only African country never to have been colonized. Anybody know that? No grown-ups back there putting up their hands either. Okay, the grown-ups all know that. <laughs> okay, so no kids. Ethiopia is the only African country never to have been colonized. 
the Italians invaded it in 1935. Do you know that? Have, do you know anything about the Italian invasion? Yes, how, how did you come across that fact? <coughs> did you read about it in history? That's fantastic. Is this one of your history students? <laughs> That, it's, it's, it, that's really good to hear because it's, it's a subject that people kind of don't really pay a whole lot of attention to, but the Italian invasion of Ethiopia is really considered by historians to be kind of the first opening sequence of World War II because it sent a lot of messages to the big powers of Europe. So the fact that nobody would stop the Italians from attacking this country told Hitler that they weren't going to stop him if he attacked countries in Europe. Um, it showed how powerless what, what were called the, um, the great powers of Europe, showed that they were powerless to have any control over a country that wanted to invade. And it also was kind of a testing ground for Italy um, to use their aircraft, which at the time were kind of state-of-the-art bombers. And they went against this country that basically had only just kind of pulled itself out of medieval times. The, pop, the Ethiopian population basically um, went barefoot. They, they didn't wear shoes. Most of them still don't wear shoes. And even the, even the emperor's imperial guard didn't wear shoes, okay? They were using spears. They were using antiquated rifles, some of which were about 60 years old. Most of them didn't have ammunition or they had to trade it or make it themselves or whatever. So, these state-of-the-art bomber aircraft were, and tanks and machine guns were going against a population that really couldn't fight back. How many of you know um, about uh, that there is a, such a thing as poison gas that can be used in warfare? Yeah, lots of people. Okay, H have you heard of mustard gas? No, okay, mustard gas what, I'm assuming if you haven't heard of mustard gas, you also don't know that it was used against civilian populations in Ethiopia during this invasion. You ever heard that? Mustard gas was used in World War I. It was then kind of banned um, as for use in warfare because it was so horrible. So even if you have a gas mask on, if, if mustard gas reaches you, it will burn your skin you have to be completely covered up to avoid it. It will also poison everything around you. So it will poison the drinking supply, it'll poison water, it'll poison um, any animals that are around. If you touch someone who has been contaminated with it, you can get burns on your hands just from touching the person who has been affected by it. So here is this mustard gas being dropped out of aircraft on barefoot <coughs> soldiers, and they really didn't stand a chance. So. This was kind of what I was looking at as something I really wanted to write about and tell people about, but I also wanted to tell them about Ethiopia, which is an amazing country. Um, so I, what I'm going to show you here is just a little bit of a background of um, some of the things that I brought into the book to make it into a story rather than just a history lesson. So I needed some characters you know, that people were going to relate to. And I needed to, uh, kind of some personal experience that people were going to relate to. So I drew very heavily on my own life in writing this book. My father used to work for the New York City Board of Education, and he did teacher training in Jamaica for three years. So between, when I was six years old, I went through grades one through three in Jamaica. And when we, anybody here have a relationship with Jamaica? Yes. <coughs> Your cousin's Jamaican, and how about you? You have Jamaican cousins too. You? My mom's co-worker. Okay, we have another Jamaican co-worker. My best friend. Your best friend's Jamaican? My best friend was Jamaican when I lived in Jamaica too. My father was Jamaican. Okay, so you've got Jamaican history in your family. My auntie's Jamaican. And so do you. Cool, one more. He did? What was he doing there? Was it just a, a vacation? He was, he was working in Jamaica? What was he teaching? He, he was teaching history. Fantastic. Oh, that's very cool. In Kingston. <coughs> that's awesome. Okay, so th this is, more people have relationship with Jamaica. It's not that far away. Um, and what I did was I took 
my own personal experience of being an uh, American girl in a foreign country and kind of an alien country and an undeveloped country and applied that to um, what happens in Black Dove, White Raven. So it's a story of a brother and a sister um, being raised together. Well, they're being raised as brother and sister, but they're not actually related. One is white, one is black. They grow up in Pennsylvania to about the age of 11, and then they move to Ethiopia with their mother. And that was the premise for the story. So I'm going to show you a little bit about myself and my, my Jamaican past. I'm going to sit down here while I do this. And then I'm going to take you on a very brief tour through Ethiopia itself. Right. <laughs> that's, that's me. In the, in the beautiful long blonde braids, which I no longer have. <laughs> and that is my brother, Jared. And um, they, are, this is kind of, there, there are two, two different people that I've based, two different couples, as it were, that I've based the brother and sister, Em and Teo, on in the story. And one is me and my brother, because we had a very close relationship, and we played together all the time, and, and we made up stories together. So there we are at the age of five and two. <laughs> and this is, this is us in Jamaica. I'm, I'm on the left in the pink. Can you see Jared? He's just sticking his head up in the bottom right hand corner. <laughs> he was a very goofy kid. Um, this is in our, this is taken in our front yard in Jamaica, just, just um, in the carport where the car is parked. You can see it in the background. And the kids with us are our next door neighbors. Um, they are Madge, Patrick, and Peaches. And Pe it, it is, that was her nickname. Her real name was Georgia, Georgia Peaches. <laughs> and, do you know, it's funny, because I, I look at her, and I try to think how old she is in the picture. How old, does anybody have a guess? Eight, eight, we had like eight, nine, eight. 12. Okay, she, to me, when I was six or whatever I am, she was this like teen goddess. <laughs> <laughs> she was, I, when I, even when I look at her now, I think she must be about 18, but she's not. She's much closer to what you're guessing. She's probably about 10. Um, Madge didn't, was not their, these two are sister and brother, Madge is their cousin, and she, um, if you can see the mountains in the background, her family lived um, way up in the mountains, and there were no schools there, so they sent her to live with her cousin so she could go to school. And we all played together, and we made up stories together, and we kind of ran riot in, the, in our connecting backyards. And this is, a, this is a picture that I drew at the time. This kind of shows you sh how I got into writing and um, making up stories. My favorite thing to read when I was seven years old was a great big um, a collection of Buck Rogers comic strips that dated to the 1930s and 1940s. And this is a picture of a, um, an episode from one of those comic strips. And what we have going on here is this guy, this guy has an elaborate sort of death thing rigged up. So there's Buck Rogers lying there. He's tied up by the feet to this bent over palm tree. This, tree, this is my, my diseased brain when I was seven years old, okay? <laughs> this tree is tied down around this tree and held, and held down on this little stump here. There's his crashed rocket ship over there. <laughs> and then these are his goggles, his aviator goggles, which um, you probably can't see it from back there, but there's actually a sunbeam that is coming all the way down here through the goggles and setting fire to this vine. And when the fire burns through the vine, this tree's gonna spring up and he's gonna be tied, but hanging upside down, tied by his feet, okay? And then he's gonna be left there to die, but of course he isn't, somebody comes and rescues him. <laughs> Which is always the problem when you rig up an elaborate execution like this. Um, so that was, that was, we played Buck Rogers all the time. And I actually had, because these, these comics were published in the 1930s, I was actually able to kind of use them as I had the kids in this book making up stories and they have this kind of elaborate fantasy life. Um, 
and they write stories together. And I was actually able to use some of the stuff that I um, had enjoyed reading myself because the time period was right. This is, a, this is a, um, a little Buck Rogers story that I wrote when I was seven. The original piece of paper that this is printed on is about, is about the size of my hand. It's a piece of note paper. So this, this side of the paper, this is two sides of the same page. This side says, this is a story of Buck Rogers. Here's the whole story. One day, Buck was walking with Sally and Wilma. They were walking to a rocket ship. That's the story. So then it says, I have a more exciting story on the other side of this paper. So clearly I knew that that just wasn't enough to engage the reader. And the, the second page is actually a little bit more elaborate, even though it's not original. It was taken directly out of the comic strips. So there you have some background about how my brain worked at that time. This is my mother and her best friend in Jamaica, whose name was Rona. And my mother invited Rona to come and live with us um, because she had been uh, made for an English friend of ours. And she wasn't able to have her uh, less than a year old baby living with her. And my mother said, come live with us. You can bring your baby. You can go, you can go to school. Um, she, Rona was about 19 at the time. My mother was not a lot older. And so Rona moved in with us with her baby. My mother had a baby as well. They were about the same age. And here they are. <laughs> so this is, this is Rona's little boy, Carlton. Rona, Rona did a lot of, she kind of wished she had a little girl. She did a lot of doing his hair, really, really fancy braids. And she'd put like big bows in his hair at times. <laughs> But um, this is my little sister, Maria. They were almost exactly the same age. And so, and that's me. And so what I was doing when I thought of this book is I was kind of imagining a scenario in which these two babies who were kind of raised, you know, they would get put in the same baby buggy together, they'd play in the same playpen, they did everything together. They thought of themselves as brother and sister. What would happen to them if they grew up in a country that was about to kind of disintegrate into, um, into war? And also, what would happen to them if they did actually have a chance to grow up together as brother and sister? Because these two didn't, because we left Jamaica, and Rona and Carlton stayed behind. So that was, that was kind of the basis for my book. I'm now going to whisk you to Ethiopia. That's me getting on an Ethiopian Airlines plane. And this is, um, th I, I told you I went with my aunt and uncle. That's them over here. That's my Aunt Susan and my Uncle Roger. That's me in the middle. And then these are Susan and Roger's friends, um, Elizabeth and Rick Stoner. Rick Stoner was the head of Save the Children in East Africa at the time. So we all did a, quite a big tour. And there is pretty typical highland scenery. And what I really, what I really think, I, what I'd love to show you, not just in this little brief introduction, but also in this book, is that Ethiopia is a, it's a country of many contrasts, but the scenes that you see of it are kind of fed to you by the media, and it feels to me like they're always scenes of poverty and destruction and people who are starving, and you don't get to see the side that shows that they have this rich cultural heritage going back 3,000 years. They have uh, their own ancient language, which is the language of the church. It's called Gez, and it's like they use it the way Latin is used as the ancient language of the Christian church. They have many traditions. As I said, they're the only African country never to have been colonized. And this, this scene is taken in a, a valley, a farming valley, where they've got an irrigation project going, and it's working really well. And this is a scene, a lot, a, the largest part of their population is Christian, but uh, there's also quite a large Muslim population as well. And this is the city of Harar, which is the, um, the holy city for, for Islam in, in Ethiopia. And it's walled. It's got this thousand years old wall around it, which you can just kind of make out there. And these are kind of typical, typical <laughs> village houses. Um, so 
that's what the people in the book would be living in, except that these are near um, what's called Lali Bella, uh, a village called Lali Bella, and for some reason or other there, they're two stories high. Usually they're just one story high, but round stone with thatch on top, very, very typical. And then there you have a group of traditional singers and musicians, and this woman is doing a coffee ceremony. Um, coffee is said to have originated in Ethiopia. It, uh, have any of you ever went, gone out for Ethiopian food? Yeah, yeah. okay, many more of you, that's good, because there's there are quite a few excellent restaurants in this area. Have you seen a coffee ceremony? Yeah? yeah? yeah. No, okay. Well, only a woman is allowed to make coffee. And, <laughs> and in the ceremony, you would boil the coffee in this little, this little um, fire pit, and, or you boil the water, and you would roast your seeds, your coffee beans in it as well, and grind them yourself. And then this is incense because it's supposed to be, and these, these greens are just spread around to you know, create atmosphere. It's supposed to be a calm ceremony. It's, it's special. It's a time for you know, sort of sitting back. And the coffee is served in several rounds, so it gets stronger and stronger each time. And that's a spice market. Lots of different spices for sale there. That's a church. This round architecture is kind of typical. This is probably about 100 years old. Some church paintings. And then I have, oh, this is a school. So here you, have, here you kind of have your, your counterparts. Um, this, is a, this school goes up to eighth grade, I believe. That's Rick, my, my uncle's friend, Rick. And these are um, staff from the school. I believe one of them is the head of the school, and one of them is, uh, I think, maybe the eighth grade teacher. And then here you have some students from the school, a bit younger than you. This girl um, was pretty good at speaking English, and they were, they were, we just dropped in on this school. They didn't know we were turning up, and they were very, very anxious to show off um, what they knew and what they could do. They had a very high pass rate for the national exam. So a lot of their students went, to, went on to high school. And uh, this, is, this is a school where, I don't know if you can see, I, I actually focused on the students in the picture and not on the extreme poverty that they're schooling in. Their books, are, their books must be 30 years old, okay? Um, their desks are made of stone. And when um, they were asked to, some of them were asked to get up and recite for us, and this girl stood up and said she had a question for us, and it was, what are you going to do for my school? And you know, there's not a whole lot that I can do for her school. Um, so the one thing I can do is kind of show this to you and, and show you how people are learning in other countries and just make you a bit more aware of other cultures. Um, and this is, a, this is a typical improved road. Many of the roads there are actually funded by the Chinese government. This is called the Chinese road. Um, but it, you can tell it's improved because it's graded, it's flat, even though it looks pretty bleak. These, this was my aunt and uncle's landlord um, when they lived there in the 60s. Um, still there, still in the same house. And this is my aunt Susan. We went to the town where they lived, and we visited the school where they taught 35 years later, and this woman was one of my aunt's students. And so she had taught her English, and she's now um, a teacher in the middle school and high school there, which we thought was pretty neat. And so I'm going to finish on this picture, which is my aunt, again, um, talking to some of the <coughs> high school students. And these girls probably are your age. Okay, and they're, they're the ones that have gone on to high school. And they're actually taught in English at this point. Um, English is, is the language of, of teaching in, at the high school level. So that leaves us with five minutes before I start asking, well, I will start asking you questions. Where I'm gonna let you ask me questions in a minute, but I'm gonna ask you a few <coughs> questions. Um, I've brought with me some Ethiopian artifacts. <laughs> um, and I'm gonna, get them out and show them to you. So first of all, this is a, um, 
well, obviously it's a map. <laughs> I think it's a US, I'm, I'm going to read what it says on it so I don't give you poor information. Yes, it's put out by the Defense Mapping Agency Aerospace Center, okay? So it's, a it's they put out a big series of maps, but this is basically a great big enormous um, air defense map of Ethiopia. And it, it's also got um, quite a bit of Eritrea in it. Um, so you, if, you looked at, if you looked at a map of the United States or of the East Coast, there would actually be a whole bunch of population centers in it. Yeah. And, and as you can see, most of this is mountain. All that bit is <coughs> desert. That is the Afar Desert. It is the hottest place in the world. And it's below sea level. So that's quite a bit of um, vast terrain going on there. Now these things, I'll pass them around. You can take a look. I, I, have, I have some coins here. In fact, I'm going to pass around. I'm going to pass around a few of them so you can each get a look. Um, but these are just, you know, regular stuff. And this is a this is a little silver cross. There's four of them there. I'll pop them around. Whoops! You haven't got any hands. <laughs> Make sure everybody gets to see. Um, this is a little silver cross, and these lots and lots of country kids wear these. They're made out of, they're hammered out of the previous coinage, um, which the standard, standard um, money that they used up until very recently was the Maria Teresa silver dollar, some of which were, you know, 200 years old. A lot of them got turned into those crosses. Anybody have any idea what this thing is? Yes. What? Uh, it is made of wood. It is a stick. A pencil? No, it does look like one, but it isn't. Yes. Uh, that's a really good guess, a coffee stirrer, but that is not what it is. Yes. It's not a flute. No, it's solid the whole way through. Anybody else? Did they, did they get to see this in the back? Pass it back. Yes. Drumstick, also a good guess. It's not a musical instrument, so it's not a flute, not a drumstick. It, no, it's not for smoking. Any other guessy, guesses? Yes. Use it to eat, no. But whoever's thinking it's something you put in your mouth is on the right track. Who said that? Toothbrush is exactly what it is. <laughs> it doesn't have bristles. It's a stick made of eucalyptus, okay? And this bit on the end is just carving to make it look pretty. This bit, they've peeled the bark off, and what you do with it is you just stick it in your mouth and scrape. You know eucalyptus? It's like mint flavor, okay? Eucalyptus trees grow everywhere. They were imported, but they grow really fast, so that means you can harvest them really quickly, and they're used for toothbrushes all over the place. Do you want to pass this around? I have one more thing to make you guess about. Yes. It, it looks like a kind of jewelry, but it isn't. Use in rituals. That is a very vague answer, so I will say yes, you are correct. It is used in rituals. Did you have a guess, or did that ruin what your guess was? <laughs> yes, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> wow, you guys are good. I don't think I've ever had anybody actually guess what these things are. What was your question? No, they don't put toothpaste on it. They just use it as it is. I haven't, because I only have two. And <laughs> and I like to keep them to show off to people, so I haven't used one. I haven't even tasted it. 
but you can really, that probably doesn't, that's quite old. It probably doesn't have any kind of flavor anymore. Have you ever like picked a, picked a twig of birch bark off a tree? Picked a twig of birch off a tree? Yes. Yeah? And you can like chew on the bark and it tastes kind of minty? No. No? <laughs> you guys haven't lived. <laughs> In your mouth. <laughs> See, we, we actually, in Jamaica, we did a lot of that. We just picked everything and ate it. I don't know why, but we're still alive. So, Does it really brush your teeth? I mean, yeah, I think it does. Basically, if you think about it, what, you're what a toothbrush does is it just scrapes the plaque off your teeth, essentially. So, I mean, you can do it with your fingernail. So a piece of wood that's like a little bit flavored would do a pretty good job of keeping your, keeping your teeth clean. So yeah, in answer to what this is, it's used in a ritual and it is used to stick a coffee pot in because Ethiopian coffee pots, and I don't know if you can, oops, oops, let me just ruin all the Library of Congress's equipment. <laughs> Ethiopian coffee pots, I'm not sure you can see in this pit. You can't really, but you get an idea. They're round, they're completely round, okay? So it can't stand up on it, it, it can't stand up on its own, so it needs a, this, this has got a bottom, but the coffee pot wouldn't, it needs something to sit it in. So that's exactly what that's for. Okay, that's, that's kind of all the time that I have for my part of the presentation, but now I would love it if you had questions for me. And we're gonna pass the microphone around to you because uh, this is being recorded, and, and we want you to be able to um, Can we start over here? to hear your question. Okay, yeah, start over here. Um, when you were decided to write your book, what in like what made you come up with the title of the book? That okay, that's actually uh, it's it's a it's it's not the most original question in the world, but it's a great question for this book because this has a a funny story behind the title. I had, it's not, it's not funny, haha, it's kind of funny, peculiar. For my previous book, Rose Under Fire, I had struggled and struggled and struggled with the title and nobody liked the title that I liked for it because they thought that it sounded too much like a fantasy novel. I wanted to call it The Subtle Briar, which was a reference to a poem that one of the people who was in the book had written. And everybody said, no, it doesn't really match Codename Verity. We want these books to be connected. It sounds too much like fantasy, so we're not going to use it. So I had thought for this book, the, t the, the characters of the children's mothers, who uh, they're actually a flying team, okay? So they're in the 1920s. Um, Teo's mother and M's mother perform in flying circuses, and their performer, performer title are Black Dove and White Raven. They are the Black Dove and the White Raven. And then the kids later on take these names and kind of turn them into their own names and make up these superheroes based around them. And I thought when I was, when I was working on this book that Black Dove, White Raven would be a good title, but I didn't suggest it because I thought, oh, everybody's gonna say that just sounds like a fantasy title again. So they were asking me for titles and I was coming up with, you know, the Barnstormer's children, the Pilot's children, all kinds of stuff like this. And one of my editors came back to me and said, you know, I was thinking Black Dove, White Raven might be a really good title for this book. So she and I came up with the same title completely separately, okay? <laughs> And, that, and when she said that to me, I was just like, yep, that's it. It's all, you know, if we both thought of that on our own, then that clearly is the right title for it. So um, I wasn't clearly sure on what you said, but for your little sister and... Um, Carlton. Yes, Carlton. Were they like kind of your inspiration for the little girl? I mean, for the yeah. The, I mean, it was partly based on them. They, I didn't actually make that very clear. So they lived. They, they both lived in the same house, and they played with each other, and they were fed together, and they bathed together, and they did everything together until they were two. At which point, we left Jamaica, taking my little sister with us. And Carlton and Rona stayed in Jamaica because they were Jamaican. And these kids <coughs> never saw each other again. So my idea was really what would have happened if they had grown up together. 
you know, how would, how would their relationship have, have developed? And so that was, that was kind of what I was playing with when I, when I wrote the book. Um, how long did it take you to write the Black Dove White Raven book? It took um, about, I think it was about a year and a half. Um, it, might have, it, I, it was about a year and a half. It was the hardest book I have ever written. And it was kind of be behind, I had a deadline for it. And I kept getting them to extend it. <laughs> and I, th I think it was about a year and a half. Part of the reason it was so hard was because I really didn't know much about Ethiopia in 1935. I knew a lot about Ethiopia in the sixth century because I'd written some other books about it. Um, but I had to do a lot of research for the background history. And doing that and writing the book at the same time, I found very hard work. But it was about a year and a half. Who has the mic? OK. So did you show your mom and your dad the story? Oh, no. This is the answer to this question is really sad. Because my mom died when I was um, 14. That's all, right. That's all right. It was a long time ago now. And um, my father also died quite young. At, so he died when I was about 20. So neither of my parents ever got to see my finished mm -hmm. books. Um, so partly say. what was going on in Black Dove, White Raven was the, the character who is the mother, um, she's actually a very strong character in this book, um, is based on my mother. And so no, my, they haven't seen any of my books. But I was re I've really been thinking the past week, my mother would be so proud of this book. She was just <laughs> You guys are, you guys are really sweet. <laughs> she she would she would just be, be so she was a very forward thinking woman. Um, she she loved living in Jamaica. She uh, was you know really kind of involved in the civil rights movement in the 1960s and she would be really really proud that this book has has won the children's african book award and also that you know i'm here talking to you guys in the library of congress she, she'd be thrilled with that okay okay so um okay so um out of all the books that you made <clears throat> is there one that you like would favor is there one that's your favorite I, I, I don't really like to choose favorites because, because they all have kind of different, such different meaning. There's so many different things going on in them. So this one is kind of the tribute to my mother. Rose Under Fire, the one that I wrote before this, was really important to me because it was about um, a women's concentration camp that not many people know much about. And I felt like in writing that book, I was you know, bringing to a wider audience something that, that needed to be told. But Codename Verity, it has to be said, is the book that changed my life. So for, for maybe not the right reasons, Codename Verity is probably, probably my favorite. With, without, without the strengths and the success of that book, I wouldn't be here today. Um, it, 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 and that's really true. Um, so, so that's probably the one that I'm that is fondest to me. Yes. Oh, you have the mic. Sorry. <laughs> if you saw <clears throat> Peaches and the others again, what would you do? Uh, we would probably all start crying and run into each other's arms. I have actually tried to find these people on um, on the internet and have not been able to. I do actually still have some Jamaican friends. My best friend from school in Jamaica. Um, now lives in England, and she had quite a large family um, who I'm in, I'm in contact with a lot. Um, so I do actually still have some really good friends from Jamaica. Um, but this, this particular family I have lost touch with. We would, we would, there would be a tearful reunion. <laughs> How many books have you made so far? The Black Dove, White Raven is my eighth published novel. I have another one that is uh, in the works. So by next year, there will be nine. But I've written 
I don't know how many more that I didn't actually that haven't actually been published. Some of them haven't been published for kind of frustrating reasons of marketing, but most of them just aren't good enough to be published. So eight is the is the easy. Oh no, that's not the that's not the easy answer because I've forgotten. I actually had written five more under a pseudonym. <laughs> I, I always forget about those, so I don't know. There's no easy answer to that question, but let's say eight under my own name. Um, when you was little, was there a spe like before, like when you was really little and you start reading the comic? Was there a specific person to inspire you to write the book, or did you just like to write? I really just like to write. Um, so when I was when I was reading that comic. I wasn't thinking, I want to write stuff like this, even though I was going and writing it. I was more thinking, I want to be this person. <laughs> you know? I was really kind of, I was, I was relating to the characters. You know? I wanted to have adventures and to, and to um, do exciting things. Um, it, kind of, it, it was kind of tied up in my head, the, the together, you know, wanting to make the story, but also wanting to live that life. And I, again, I think I've put some of that in there, where particularly the character M really relates to her superhero character, White Raven, and she kind of thinks, what would White Raven do all the time to try to make herself do the right thing or do the brave thing or whatever. So that, that, that kind of question of identity and wanting to write and putting yourself into a story is um, something that I think a lot of writers they, they kind of go hand in hand. Does that make sense? Okay, good. From living in Jamaica, how would you um, be able to relate it to like living here? Living in the, okay, so like the difference between living in Jamaica and living here or how does that influence me? <coughs> like the difference. The difference. I, when I came, I was, cause I started, can you pass the, pass the mic to the back? Cause I think people there are, are losing out. <laughs> um, when I first came here, I was nine years old. So, like, I left the U.S. when I was three, and I didn't come back till I was nine. So, essentially, my earliest memories are not of living in the U.S. And it was really hard. It was really hard adjusting. Um, everybody thought I'd come from Puerto Rico. Like, nobody had heard of Jamaica. Most days, or in that place, um, I felt like nobody understood me, and and it was hard to acclimatize. I, I, I was again an immigrant, so that, that's I think one of the reasons I do a lot of writing about people who are who are displaced. How which which uh, place does this book which which place does this book influenced off of? What was the last part of that question? The, so this book, mm -hmm. which place was it influenced from? Oh, okay. So, well, it, obviously it's set in Ethiopia, but it's, it, it was really my experience of living in Jamaica that influenced it because the kids in this story, they, they're living in a place that's not their own. You know, they're living in an unfamiliar, very foreign country. Um, and they learn to speak the local language, but they are still obviously foreigners. Um, so that kind of a relationship with the country is something that I drew on living in Jamaica. Um, but also just kind of a celebration of the countryside, because one of the things that we did in Jamaica was, I was saying that we ate everything. We just, we, we, we ran up and down um, other, everybody's backyards and climbed all their trees and we picked fruit and we just kind of we climbed on people's roofs and just all this, all the, that kind of running wild and, and feeling very comfortable and at home in the landscape is something that was true for me in Jamaica. And I took that and put it in this book even though I hadn't actually experienced living in Ethiopia. Uh, this will be our last question. Um, like, are all your books influenced off a of war in, in Ethiopia? No, um, my first two, that was, the question was, are all my books, um, have they all been influenced by the war in Ethiopia? Just, this is the only one that, that 
has anything to do with the Italian invasion of Ethiopia. Codename Verdi and Rose Under Fire are both set in Europe during World War II. So uh, the, the one thing that they all have in common is they all have women as pilots in them, young women um, learning to fly, which is something you've got to keep your minds open and just remember that you can do too if you ever get the chance. <laughs> I've, and I think um, that, uh, unfortunately, is the last question that you guys get to get to ask me. Um, so now I'm going to turn back over to so Pam. So please, let's give Elizabeth Wien a round of applause. Can I also can I also say thank you to you for coming out here and for sitting and listening and asking great questions because it is the the best thing about being a writer is to get to talk to people um, and who are interested in what you have to say. So thank you. You all yeah. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.